The Southern Hemisphere's aviation market looks a lot different than the Northern Hemisphere. North America's aviation market flew three to four times more passengers than South America. European markets served almost five times as many passengers as Africa, and Asia had triple the amount of Oceania. Typically, this would make the Southern Hemisphere markets much smaller. However, Latin America has come up with a solution to this. Once upon a time, there was LAN Airlines, operating from Peru and Chile, and TAM Airlines, operating in Brazil. In 2010, a joint agreement was reached to merge these into one airline which combined the names to be known simply as LATAM, with branches in multiple Latin American countries, including Brazil, Chile, and Peru. Today, we take an adventure on their 777s from their Sao Paulo, Brazil hub across the Atlantic Ocean to Milan, Italy. Timestamps will be down below. I hope you enjoy the journey. Welcome to South America's largest airport, where we take a flight on South America's largest airline. That's right, today we're trying LATAM for the first time from Sao Paulo's Garulos Airport on one of their longest flights out to Milan, Italy an 11-hour flight in their premium business class, as it's known. LATAM has been a bucket list item for me, and I had to do it on their 777, which is largely regarded as their best business class product. Sao Paulo also had their best lounge, apparently, until Lima and Santiago renovated their LATAM lounges recently, so I'm excited to check that out. Welcome to Terminal 3 at Garulos Airport, the newest of the terminals here. I've covered it in two or three videos in the past, but never in their flagship airline, so you know we had to get back out here. The Tom actually has this little separate check-in area at the beginning of the curb here. This is not actually for business class passengers, instead for the highest level of Latam and Delta Airlines status members. I gave it a valiant effort, but was directed into the main part of the terminal, which houses almost all of the international flights from Garulos. After passing through the normal business class check-in area, our bags were checked in and our boarding pass issued. Then it was off to the departures area to go through security and get our passport stamp. Through immigration, we find the duty-free shops and the walkway to Terminal 2 for passengers with connecting international flights between the two terminals. If we venture down the hallway, we reach this central area. More shops and restaurants, but up above, you'll see an assortment of lounges. This is where most of the lounges are, in Garulos' Terminal 3. Up the escalator, we find five lounges and a massage parlor. The American Airlines Admirals Club at Garulos is supposed to be incredible, but just look at the entrance to this Latam Lounge. Without ever getting inside, I was always impressed with the appearance of just this entrance wall. Finally getting the chance to enter, we head around the corner and check into the lounge, and then we're in. The entrance hallway has the status boards with all the departing flights and water, as well as an NFT artwork gallery, because of course it does. The first room that we enter is the bar, with plenty of seating. That is actually a continuing theme that we see here. This lounge was absolutely packed at this time of day, but the sheer amount of seats made it feel alright. It's also impressive how much a little wall partition can do towards the appearance of privacy. Throughout the entire lounge, you have an admittedly blocked but still sweeping view of the ramp and runways. It was like watching Jaws with all the tails sticking up above the terminal roof. I did like this little theater setup here in the back of the lounge. A big screen with seats. Not that you could pick what was on there, but I would imagine it's a great place to watch a good football game. A bit further down that back wall, we find a workspace with printer and a large work table. And then in the very back corner, a little more seating, cause why not? They do have a sleeping area for passengers with long layovers, but we can put that on the list of places that I won't take my camera. And then, in the middle of the lounge, surrounded by the privacy slats, was the large dining area. There was an extensive buffet, full of antipasti items and appetizers, breads, hot items, fresh items, and of course, a lot of desserts. On top of all of that was the drinks that they had available and a full ice cream freezer. I grabbed some food and a seat by the edge of the lounge. These were the first seats to be taken, so I was lucky to find one open. 
The only problem, I mentioned that seats were never an issue in this lounge, the same cannot be said for tables. As you'll see that I look like a fool here with my food on a chair across from me, but hey, a man's still gotta eat, right? Before leaving the lounge, as is this channel's protocol, we gotta stop by the showers. The keys are at the front desk, and they request you keep it under 30 minutes, although there didn't appear to be a backlog at this time of day at least. The room was a great size with all the amenities one could really need to completely freshen up for their flight. The only thing that was weirdly uncomfortable for some reason was the faucet on the side of the sink. By the time I left the shower, boarding was soon, so I wanted to go head off to the gates. As mentioned, most international airlines operate from Terminal 3, and as South America's biggest aviation hub, there's no shortage of fun aircraft here. We see all kinds of things, like the ETA Airways A350, the British Airways A350, we had TAP Portugal's Star Alliance A330neo, and of course, a ton of LATAM aircraft. My favorite place to hang out and kill time in this terminal when I don't have lounge access is all the way at the end where you can get great views of the runways and taxiways and really get some great shots of all the unique aircraft at this diverse worldwide aviation hub. Gates 307 and 308 were our gates today for Milan. I somehow timed my arrival perfectly as right when I got to the gate I saw our 777 being pulled in from its remote stand. This particular aircraft is about 16 years old, originally with TAM Brazilian Airlines prior to the merger when it became LATAM in 2016, where it remains. One thing I will say is that Garulos Airport seems to be remote stand heaven. It seems as if, of all the airports that I've been to, Garulos has the most aircraft arriving in the morning, being towed to a remote stand for multiple hours, and then being towed back for an evening departure. Latam does board by group, and business class passengers are in group 1. The only issue is that with gate lice, I thought I was in the correct line, but actually wasn't even in a line at all. So while I did get to board with group 1, I was the last group 1 passenger on board. Just a bit unfortunate since it made it tougher to shoot some content. We also see a bunch of advertisements for American Airlines credit cards. It seems to me like American Airlines and Garulos Airport have some form of partnership with the amount of routes, the crazy nice lounge, the advertisements, and the ginormous maintenance hangar that American Airlines built seven years ago. Back to Latam now. Welcome on board the premium business class of the 777. Since I was the last person on board in this cabin, it was really tough to get shots. So here are some of the shots that I got after arrival to Milan. You can see the beautiful 121 cabin setup using the white, gray, and red in a way that I think makes a beautiful cabin. I would say that the even numbered rows are best as the counter provides a bit of extra privacy along the aisle. In addition, there's a larger forward cabin, and then aft of the boarding door is a smaller cabin of business class seats. I typically prefer the front cabin since it's much more private on boarding, but all of those seats were booked, so we head to the back to row 10, the last row of business class cabin where we find our seat today, 10A. While everyone climbs on board, let's talk about the seat a bit. First off, the headrest is a red leathery material and can be adjusted by raising, tilting, and curling the edges for maximum comfort. The seat itself is actually pretty wide, and I found the cushion to be extremely soft. Against the window is a fixed armrest. Not the most substantial thing, but it helps stabilizing my phone for filming at least. There's two windows of this seat, and with the counter on the aisle side, it means we have easy access and visibility through these windows. In front of us is a fairly large TV and literature pocket. The TV is touchscreen in addition to the seatback remote. We'll look at the entertainment options once we get in flight. Next to that is a little coat hook. And next to that is the literature pocket where we find the safety card and the menu for this flight. Below that is actually another pocket where I kept my laptop for takeoff and landing. Under the TV is the footrest. It's a fairly wide footrest comparatively to other similar looking seat styles, and I gotta appreciate the incline as it provides an excellent place to rest your feet when you aren't in bed mode. And the lack of underfoot wall storage isn't the end of the world since there's enough in-seat storage, and then the backpack can go up in the overhead bin. On the aisle side is a large counter, and I have to say that the black marble look is 
potentially one of the best looking counters of any aircraft I've flown in my travels. It's plenty large enough to get work done, or whatever else you need while using the main tray table for eating. Speaking of which, the tray table comes out with the push of a button, and then you have this surface that isn't the largest, but plenty big enough for eating and working. On the side of the counter is some shortcuts for seat adjustments and privacy settings, in addition to the main adjustments up above. Behind that is a flap that holds the remote for the TV. The remote comes out with the push of a button and is super handy if you're relaxed or sleeping and can't reach the TV. And then in the corner of the counter is the main storage of the seat. For starters, on the front of the storage is the universal and USB charging ports. Around the corner from that is the main seat controls with presets and individual seat adjustments. There's also the headset jack in a good place so you don't have the wire all tangled up around you. There's a railing of sorts to hold in whatever items you're keeping in this area, including some of the items that they stocked for us, plus chargers and stuff that you want in your seat. To make it all even better, there's an enclosed box for storage and was actually big enough for all my chargers and some amenities. Towards the top of the seat shell, there's also a reading light. It can be turned on and off, as well as dimmed, but it can't be aimed and swiveled like some other reading lights. There is another reading light on the overhead bins above you, but unfortunately, no individual air vents. As far as the amenities, first was the pre-departure beverage, for which I chose sparkling wine to go along with my cashews. Then the water bottle that was supplied at each seat. With the water bottle, there was also a set of slippers that were super comfy. Speaking of being comfy, the bedding was one of the main highlights for me, starting with the mattress pad. These aren't always a given, but when an airline can give you a mattress pad that is fairly thick, it really makes a big time difference. Then is the comforter, which is fairly thick and quite possibly the most comfortable comforter I've ever used on an airplane. I may choose this one over Emirates first class comforter even. Lastly was the pillow, which was like a normal bed pillow, not just some small airplane pillow. It was incredible to see the effort that Latam had put into their incredible bedding. Then was the headphones in a similar bag to reduce single use plastics. The headphones were fairly uncomfortable, but still noise cancelling. The majority of my props, however, goes to the bag it was stored in, as Latam has almost completely eliminated their single-use plastics in addition to being the first South American airline to commit to sustainable aviation fuels. And the last amenity was the amenity kit, and possibly one of the more fun amenity kit bags that I've ever seen. As for the contents, they're admittedly basic, although I do very much like the colors that went into it with the addition to the lip balm, lotion, and towelette from a local Brazilian brand. As we taxi for departure, I want to share a fun story with you guys. Sao Paulo was actually the first place I was robbed at gunpoint. My first trip here, as a matter of fact, as I was walking around, I had some dude knock me into a wall, put me at gunpoint, and take everything I had on me. Thank God I left my passport in my hotel room or that trip would have become an entirely different story. I know I probably should have been more scared in that moment, but the only emotion in my mind was just me thinking to myself, bro, this is so annoying. I need my phone for directions, translations, and I need my cash and credit cards to get back to the airport and all that. I walked quickly but aimlessly to a police station hoping they could help. Now here's the thing. I speak English and enough Spanish to get by. What I don't speak is Portuguese. This proved to be an issue as not a single police officer spoke English or Spanish. I mean, I know they speak Portuguese in Brazil, but as a South American country and also for as international of a city as Sao Paulo is, I would have thought someone spoke English or Spanish at least. Eventually they got a cop over that could speak some broken English. For whatever reason, the thief didn't take my Apple Watch so I could find my iPhone to find the exact building it was in. The police just told me, oh yeah, we won't go there. If they bring it back outside, we can get it, but once it's in there, we can't do anything. Like, bro, I know where my stuff is, and it's kind of crucial for me getting back to the US. If you're literally the police, can't you just go get it? I mean, even Oakland Police Department will get into the cuts if they need to. Lo and behold, I was able to get a sketchy, possibly fake phone from some off-brand Apple store. It was the third store I tried considering because I had to buy it with my PayPal. 
I also couldn't log into my PayPal since I couldn't type in the verification code since I didn't have my phone. So I had to call my girlfriend and my parents from this Brazilian store owner's phone until one of them picked up and then I had to convince them to let me use their PayPal account to buy this phone on the promise that I would get them back once I was back home since I was heading home the next morning. Now you may be wondering why I needed an iPhone or camera phone of some sorts. Well if you've seen my Azul video from late 2022, you know why. It took me so long to get that Azul flight at a good price, and I wasn't going to let it slip away from me. It actually would have probably cost me more to rebook than it was to get that possibly off-brand iPhone. But now y'all gotta go check out that Azul video after this one and see how far this channel has come in a year and a half. I've pretty much only had sketchy experiences here. I've lost phones, money, all kinds of belongings. So you might be asking, hey Patrick, why on earth do you keep going back to a place that basically hates you? Aviation is the answer. For whatever reason, cool aviation events trump the desire to stay safe sometimes. Nothing like spending all my money on a business class flight and having to stay in some sketchy hotel in a bad part of Sao Paulo, basically asking for it. All for aviation though. To quote my late friend Kyle, if I die, at least I'll die smiling. In the air, as is tradition, we must first look through the in-flight entertainment options. First off, on the menu we have a few categories for movies, TV shows, music, games, reading, and flight information. For the movies, you can see the sheer amount of genres offered. Each genre had actually a pretty good amount of selections. I found there to be a ton of great American options, which is great considering they're still growing their American presence. You can also add things to favorite to make them easier to find later on. A great touch to these systems that have this wide of a selection. TV options also have a million genres, just like movies. Once again, a great selection of shows, especially some American favorites. The music selection was fun and I did actually enjoy some of the options as they have mostly American and Latin music. Under each genre, there are full albums of songs that can be favorited, just like the movies and shows. They had a good selection of games, typical games, but still a good amount of choices. The reading section was one of the most intriguing. Although I didn't use it on this flight, it takes you to the Latam Play section, 
with material on their destinations and airline information. The last menu option is the My Flight page with all kinds of flight info, but most important was just the map. Speaking of which, they do have a map that can be moved, adjusted, and all in order to get all different sorts of views of your flight and aircraft info. Unfortunately, it appears that the flights at this time do not have Wi-Fi on board. Before the meal, quickly looking through the menu, which houses both the food and drink options for this flight, starting with a welcome note. The first pages are the drink options, albeit mostly wine selections and then a smaller selection of not wines. Then was the menus for the meals. First was a dinner after departure. It took up two pages solely because it was written in English, Portuguese, and Italian. After that was the admittedly smaller breakfast before arrival, our second and final meal of the flight. Enough talking about the menus, let's see the food you can actually order off the menus. First off was the starter. I'm a big smoked salmon fan, so this gets two thumbs up from me as a cold smoked salmon with chive cream cheese and basil oil with a bread and a side salad. Also a quick time out as well to give props to the silverware, which was really nice quality actually, but more importantly it had the engraved logo on it. For dinner, they were out of my first choice, as is the biggest drawback of sitting in the last row of business class. I did get to try the signature dish, however, which included surubi with baru and pepper, along with a plantain and rice stew with toasted onion, coconut, parsley, chives, and cilantro. For dessert, I wanted to go with the more chef-crafted item, which was this cup of macerated strawberries with mint whipped cream, sliced strawberries, meringue, and cocoa nibs. Way better than any of the other options on the dessert menu by the looks of it. During our meal, I will add that the entertainment system crashed, so it had to be rebooted, which took a long, long time. Fortunately, with the little side counter, it was easy to watch stuff on my laptop while I enjoyed my dinner. Eventually, it did get rebooted successfully, shortly after the meals had been collected. To wrap up the dinner service, I decided to go with a tea and this little dark chocolate that they passed out to everyone. Here's the only issue. There was a language barrier as only the purser spoke English well enough on this flight. Everyone else was speaking Portuguese and Italian. So when I asked for tea, they ended up bringing me a coffee. I thanked them and nodded, but it wasn't exactly what I wanted before trying to get a bit of sleep. Speaking of which, before sleep, as we were leaving the coast of South America, we hit some gnarly turbulence. So we had to deviate around that and the convective activity in the area, leading us to this fun little game of looking at the map and playing Guess Where the Thunderstorms Were. As we prepare for the cabin to go dark, it's time to set up the bed, since we only had about nine hours left before arrival and I wanted to wake up for breakfast. We can use the presets on the side of the counter or the panel on top of the counter to move the seat. First off, we see the Relax preset, which does angle you back a bit, including tipping the seat back and raising the leg rest. All in all, super comfortable, especially with the incline footrest. My favorite perk just being the fact that it does tip you back. From there, we bring it down, all the way down into the bed. It does go entirely flat and the seat shell and counter provide some excellent privacy once laying in the seat and the leg rest reaches all the way to the foot rest. Then to set up the bedding, starting with the mattress pad. It hooks around the headrest and then lays flat along the seat and covers everything but the foot rest, presumably so it doesn't get too dirty since a lot of people do sleep with their shoes on on airplanes. Then we can place the pillow down. You'll notice that it takes up the entire space since it's plenty large enough. It's like sleeping in an actual bed. Lastly is the comforter. As mentioned, it is possibly the softest and most comfortable comforter I've used on an airplane. On top of that, I must say that I commend Latam's color choice. The slightly off-white used on the soft seat shell, bedding, and amenities are usually tough since they show dirt so much more, but they really pulled it off and it looks fantastic. Once made, the bed is all super comfortable and looks great. It's plenty wide enough and long enough. I only wish the armrest could be lowered to make it even wider. 
You can see here that in the footwell there is plenty of space for your feet. It's maybe a bit low, but still tall enough for your feet to stand up. It's also wide enough for side sleepers. That is the one thing I really like with the 777 and A350s. Since it has a wider cabin, the seats can be marginally larger, and although a small difference, it makes a noticeable impact. We can then use the Do Not Disturb button on either of the seat controls to turn on a little red light along the floor panel on the aisle of the seat. I'm gonna get some sleep for now, but I'll see you all in a bit. Good morning from basically Africa. When I woke up, we were just past Senegal, just off the coast of Western Sahara or Morocco, as we traced the coastline up towards Europe. I did notice we saw some other aircraft alongside us, which, upon landing, I was able to check, and it was the Latam 787 from Sao Paulo to Paris. So hello, Latam friend. Why are you so much faster than us? The lavatories in the 777 can be fun because of how big the cabin is, meaning they can make larger lavatories, usually with different lighting or special floor or wall accents. Unfortunately, there was nothing really special about the lavatories on board Latam's 777s. There was also no amenities. We did have the amenity kits though, so I won't hold it against them too much. As we approached Europe, the views were fun as we passed right through the Strait of Gibraltar, and then the sun began to rise as we made our way across the Iberian Peninsula and the North Mediterranean. So I'm gonna shut up for a moment and let the views speak for themselves. Our meal began with a hot towel, although I was still too warm in this cabin, so I had to let it cool off a bit. Then I was given a choice of juices, and I chose to start with the pineapple juice. While we enjoyed the sunrise, however, the crew was hard at work preparing our breakfast before arrival. Now you'd think that the crew would try to prioritize myself and the other couple passengers for the second meal since they ran out of our first choice on the first meal. Unfortunately, however, that did not happen, and once again, they ran out of my first choice. I was super disappointed because I was really looking forward to the ham and cheese croissant sandwich, and nothing else really sounded all that good. But by the time they got to me, the only thing they had left was the European breakfast. Not a huge fan of these regardless, but here you can see the assortment of cheese and cold cuts that made up my breakfast meal along with the many different breads that I was given. There was also the yogurt and granola cup here, and I did like how they kept the granola separate at least so it wouldn't get soggy. Breakfast was admittedly served a bit late, presumably so the people who wanted to sleep could maximize their sleep, but it meant that as we were still wrapping up the meal, the descent was upon us. And the best part about flying to Milan is the view you get of the Alps. Coming from the south, it might not be as close of a view, but it still makes for a great backdrop for our arrival. Speaking of the arrival, as we make our descent into the Italian fashion capital, let's talk a bit about the history of Latam. When it comes to the history of Latam, it's interesting because the airline isn't even 15 years old, but the product is a merger of other larger and older airlines. LAN was one of the oldest airlines in the world from the 1920s, while TAM was a bit different, operating as two separate airlines until Brazil lifted some regulations and allowed them to merge and create TAM. So basically, two of the largest South American carriers, LAN and TAM, joined forces in 2010 to create the largest carrier in Latin America, and in 2012, the two carriers officially became one brand, LATAM. LATAM, as it's known, is still owned and ran in Chile as LATAM Airlines Group, although it does have its subsidiaries like LATAM Ecuador, LATAM Paraguay, LATAM Peru, LATAM Colombia, and formerly LATAM Argentina, in addition to, of course, LATAM Brazil, our choice for today. 
From a customer experience, they're nearly identical, but from a managerial standpoint, they need these subsidiaries so they can operate hubs and essentially separate operations in each country without needing to apply for all kinds of complicated rights. While not currently in an alliance, they left One World in 2020. Currently, they're in a joint venture with Delta. Latam Brazil is definitely the largest of the Latam branches, especially looking at the domestic portfolio. In 2023, Latam got 17 new airplanes, and 15 of those were for Latam Brazil, including mostly A320 and 21 Neos and five 787s, making Latam the largest Dreamliner fleet in Latin America, passing Aeromexico and Avianca, used mostly within South America and between South America and Madrid. Latam's post-pandemic growth is looking great, seeing over 82% load factors in November, less than 1% under the pre-pandemic levels, in addition to more than 26% increase in revenue. In Brazil specifically, the domestic flights are making up for the slow recovery of international traffic. Still a few million passengers behind 2019 numbers, but they still hold 40% market share making it the largest carrier in the country on top of their 24% international market share from Brazil, projected to grow another 7-9% to this year in 2024. And since the demand is there, that means the extra planes should equate to more seats, more money, and therefore more growth. I, as a San Franciscan, would love to see a return of nonstop service between my hometown and South America. Something that LAN gave us, or LAN, from San Francisco to Lima until the merger of these two carriers. thoughts? I loved it. Without a doubt, I would choose to fly with Latam again. Let's recap how we got to that conclusion, however. First off, Latam has a few different hubs, although each one sees a majority of one aircraft, so the 777 is almost entirely out of Sao Paulo. That being said, Latam's services seem to be great at Santiago and Lima as well, and we do have plans this year to fly from Santiago to Melbourne, Australia on one of their Trans-Pacific routes, so be sure to check that out. As far as Sao Paulo, even though I have a love-hate relationship with the city, I do like the airport. I think they made it fairly efficient to get to the gate, and if you do have lounge access, there's some great spaces. The Banco Safra lounge caters to most airlines. Go check out my Swiss business class video from 2023 if you want to see that lounge. I've also heard incredible things about the American Airlines Admirals Club in Sao Paulo, which makes sense considering the long-standing partnership between American Airlines and Garulos Airport, stemming from US Airways before American Airlines even merged with them back in the 2010s. The Latam Lounge, however, is officially my favorite South American lounge. Being more recently renovated than most South American lounges, I always wanted to step inside after seeing the absolutely stunning entrance when walking past it every time. I'd say it lived up to the expectations. We were there during the busiest time of the day, with all the transatlantic services leaving within a few hours, and even still, there was space to relax. I even got a seat along the window. The food was great, the showers were nice, and the assortment of rooms was excellent. Moving on to the airplane, I specifically wanted to fly Latam's 777s since it has their newest business class cabin, and let me say that it was 100% worth it. I was like the last business class on board, so I couldn't get the best shots of the cabin, but from the moment I got on board, it was a stunningly beautiful cabin. Great colors, great accents. I definitely suggest the even numbered seats as the counter offers extra privacy, but the odd numbered seats still looked comfortable. I always had plenty of space, never felt cramped, 
and had enough storage for everything I needed to have handy. The bedding was fantastic with a thick mattress pad, soft, comfortable, and large pillow. The Tom is up there amongst the best business class beds in the world in my opinion, perhaps only beaten by United's Polaris. The meals were also incredible. South America and Europe have great food markets, and especially Brazil and Italy, so the potential for the meals were there. I think they executed them to perfection, perhaps the only drawback being that they ran out of my first choice on both meals. I know they can't predict the future and stock enough meals, but I feel like they should either stock extra meals based on typical trends, or offer pre-order of meals from the menu like United does. The Tom currently flies to 8 European destinations, and the price for business class varies from about $1,500 to $4,000 US dollars depending on the route and the time of year. If you can get it towards the lower end of that spectrum, I would say that it is more than worth the value, and if given the choice between European carriers on this route or Latam, I think I'd take Latam at the moment. Let me know your thoughts on Latam's long haul business class product from this video or your own experiences and stand by for our video later this year from Santiago to Australia on Latam 787. Until next Sunday, however, safe travels and I will see y'all next time.